So an official welcome to our November uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, if you would, please take a moment and introduce yourself in the chat, who you are and where you are and your connection to Central. Um, our third Thursday Lunch and Learns are a chance for the whole, entire Central community uh, to gather together to learn about scholarship and ministry interests and personal interests. Um, and as we often do, we have faculty and staff and students and alums and friends of the seminary who are with us today. Um, it is a lunch and learn, so you are invited to eat your lunch as we learn together today. Um, or as we were just saying, for those our friends in Myanmar, um, have a midnight snack or, or whatever meal time it is in whatever part of the world you're in. But we're excited today to be joined by one of Central's alums. Master of Divinity 2008 alum, Reverend Joanna Herriter, who is also the author of Expecting Nothing. Emmanuel, Eight Nothing. Women Who Prepared the Way, and she'll be leading us today on that topic. So welcome, Joanna, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so hopefully you all are taking care of the lunch part, and I'm supposed to help with the learn part, so we'll see how that goes, but um, I'm Happy to be here, see a lot of familiar faces and uh, some new new ones. And some of you may have seen, I um, have recently published with Menno Media, the Expecting Emmanuel, Eight Women Who Prepared the Way. It's a devotional uh, centered around the biblical stories of the five women that are listed in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew. And then as we move, to, it goes from November 27th, the daily readings go from November 27th, which is the earliest possible date for Advent to begin, which it does this year, which means fun times Christmas is on a Sunday. And then it goes through um, until Epiphany. And as we get towards Epiphany, we visit three characters in the New Testament, the prophet Anna the weeping mothers from the story of the slaughter of the innocents and uh, Logos slash Sophia uh, from John's pro prologue, because I didn't want to leave out John's gospel in, in the readings. So that's the, the general structure is the daily readings with a scripture to reference to read. I think a lot of devotionals have the scripture printed in them and there may be one or two sort of inspirational verses and this is not that <laughs> the whole scripture is not printed because they're longer narrative texts that you uh, can read and they're not uh, I think they're inspirational but they're not inspirational in the like I want to put this verse on my refrigerator kind of way they're more big chunks of scripture to dig into and the devotional, the daily reading, then there's a reflection, my reflection on that reading. There is a suggested spiritual practice. I define spiritual practice very broadly. So some of those suggestions are things you would consider prayer forms. Others are more interactive, writing letters to people, different things. And then there are questions to consider it's not the intent that someone would do every single action and answer, you know, write journal pages and pages on every question every day. But the hope would be there would be pieces that would spark people's attention and imagination and connection to God as they go through. At the end um, of each section of each woman's story, there's a blessing in that woman's name or in that woman's voice. And then there's artwork. Um, my friend and colleague, Michelle Burkholder, another Mennonite pastor, is an artist who works um, with paper cutout is, is the medium that is used here. So there's an image and blessing for each woman. And in the back of, of the book, there is a guide that suggests ways that this can be used in a group or a congregational 
context. So there are some worship liturgies and suggestions for what the worship focus might be each day. There is a description of how you can adapt the material if you're using it in a small group setting and some different suggestions depending on what the small group would want to focus on. Uh, there's a lot in here about parenting, for instance, might be a focus or social justice might be a focus. So that that material, as a pastor, I wanted to write a book that would not be only something helpful for individuals, but could also be something that was useful in the congregation. Advent is, I feel this way, I think it's always a challenge as a pastor, but for me, especially in these holy seasons of Advent and Lent, I so much want to provide a deep spiritual experience for my people and I want to have that for myself, and it's hard to balance all of that. And so as much as I hope individuals find this book and are touched by it and feel connected, a deeper connection to God through it, I also really hope that some pastors and leaders are able to experience Advent a little more deeply themselves have some of the work taken off their plate and be able to to rest maybe just a little bit more than normal during the season having some of the liturgies and pieces like that already um, written and there are some things in there too even for churches that aren't using the book as the basis for their advent worship there still are some pieces that could be used in more general Advent worship. So that's the general overview. What I was, what I plan to share with you all is to go through the five women in the genealogy and just pull out a little nugget from each in terms of what I think might be helpful for us as ministering people during the Advent season. I know that not everyone on this call is serving as a congregational pastor, but my assumption was with the seminary event, people connected are in some sort, some form or other of ministry. And that's uh, what I was wanting to focus on today. And then we'll have time for discussion, questions, uh, whatever else. So does that sound good, Jessica? We didn't really talk about this beforehand. <laughs> she just... That sounds perfect. That sounds amazing. <laughs> okay. So um, the first woman listed in the genealogy, which just as a side note, it's amazing to me why they're there. Um, I was talking with an, a friend yesterday who teaches uh, biblical studies at Bethel College, and we were, we were trying to, we we're just kind of wondering at the fact that that it's Matthew who puts the women in the genealogy. You would think it would be Luke, but there are no women in Luke's genealogy. So the fact of the women is amazing, but also the women that are chosen, right? This isn't Sarah. This isn't Rachel. It starts with Tamar, who has this very bizarre story of dressing up as a prostitute to seduce her father-in-law, and then he's going to burn her at the like burn her to death when he finds out she's pregnant until he learns whose child she's carrying. It's it's a soap opera worthy story. Um, but the thing I, as a pastor, am appreciating in this story um, is when you read through Tamar's story, Tamar does a lot of waiting. And there there is the waiting that she does when her when the second brother, her second husband dies, the next brother is not old enough to be married yet. And so she has to wait for him to become of age. And that's a kind of waiting that is necessary, that is a part of how life works, that you just have to have patience in the waiting. But once he crosses that age threshold, 
then she's waiting for Judah to allow her to marry his third son. And as she's waiting, she is, she does not have prospects, right? She's really stuck because she has no power or position as someone who is unmarried and childless. But she can't go get married because she is, in a sense, promised to this other, this other man. So that's a different kind of waiting. That's a waiting for justice. That's a waiting for something that should already have happened that hasn't happened yet. And that's the point where she takes matters into her own hands, right? Where she comes up with a way to get unstuck, to be able to move forward and stop the waiting. And as, I mean, as, as pastors, there are, we experience both of those kinds of waiting, right? There are times when we are waiting in a healthy way that, that God is about to do something new, that something will happen and it's just not the right time yet. And then there are times we are waiting because there are people around us who are being stubborn, who are not listening to the spirit, who are not allowing the church to move forward the way God would want it to move forward. And so being able to discern what is holy, healthy waiting and what is waiting that's being imposed on us unjustly or in a way that's not what God would want, I think is really important in the church. And I love, I mean, I have come to such an appreciation of these women. I'm not recommending dressing up as a prostitute at all, but I love that Tamar's story I feel gives us permission to be very creative in the ways that we get unstuck. And I think the less power we have in a system, the more creative we have to be. But if, if Tamar has this crazy wild plan that actually works. And so as someone who myself comes up with crazy wild plans sometimes, that's an encouragement. Um, so I think of Tamar waiting. Rahab's story is just a call. I think it's a call to pay attention to the margins, to the people who are pushed to the side, who seem to not have power because Oh, Rahab had power, right? She, she did a lot and people in her community did not recognize what she was capable of and how this applies within the church and within the society. How often do we overlook people who have gifts, who have power, but it may not look like what we expect. And so they don't, they get neglected or pushed to the edge. And then just in the broader society, I, I think in our preaching and our teaching, if we're following Jesus, we are calling people to the vision Jesus had of attending to the outcast and the marginalized. And Rahab's story is a good reminder to pay attention to the margins. I imagine most of you are ahead of me on this understanding. I did not, it didn't click in my brain until I wrote this book. The Rahab's like literal marginalization that her house was on the very edge of town, which meant it was actually built into the town wall, which was the only way that she was able to help the spies escape because when she opened her window, they could go, well, I don't, she probably didn't open it. It's not like they had glass windows. <laughs> when they went out, they, they could actually be outside the city. So being on the edge, literally on the edge was a great advantage um, in that story. So 
Rahab is calling us to attend to the margins. Um, Ruth is a very beloved uh, character. I, she stands out to me in this list of women. She's the one that people might expect to be in the list, right? She's virtuous. She has a whole book named after her. And when you read the story carefully, there are also some things in Ruth's story that can make us sit back a little bit and pay attention. One of the things I noticed in walking with Ruth for a while is this little line, and I think I noticed it because it's so much not what we usually lift up about Ruth, that when she was gleaning in the fields, she ate her fill of the food before she took the rest to Naomi. Naomi had enough. She wasn't depriving Naomi, but Ruth fed herself first. And usually when we talk about Ruth in Sunday school and the little kids' Bibles, it's she's loyal and generous and selfless and all and she is many wonderful things and she she did feed herself first and during the holy seasons i think especially um for all of you in general and for those of you who are actively pastoring especially or teaching probably, like feed, feed yourselves like make sure we have to make sure we get our nourishment um, even as we are working so hard to nurture and nourish other people. And Ruth sets that example. That's not the part of her story we tend to lift up, but it's there. The other thing that's there in Ruth, which surprised me because she, the whole book is named after her, but in the story, she does not get a lot of recognition and the attention is on Naomi. And even at the end, when Ruth has the baby, it is referred to as Naomi's. And Ruth does not seem particularly concerned about who's getting credit for what, how her, na her name is or isn't used. She's doing what she feels needs to be done. She's doing it with love. She's taking care of herself. She's taking care of the people she loves. And she's not worrying about all of this chatter. I mean, she was a Moabite, right? There was chatter going on. There were people saying things about her. Um, and it, it, there's not any indication that she was attending to that. Um, what was the phrase my my husband asked me a couple of days ago when did we start when did people start saying letting someone live rent free in my head right like this this voices that you just let bother you we don't know for sure we don't know from the story a lot about Ruth's interior life but we certainly have no indication that she was worrying about what all of them out there were saying about her. Um, Bathsheba's story is, is rough. I've gotten an email from someone who was actually preaching on Bathsheba two Sundays in a row, and I said, you are a braver woman than I am. I, I don't think I would do that. Um, and I, from Bathsheba's story, I just, as a pastor, it reminds me that we have to give people space to grieve. I think about all of the loss, the death of her husband, the death of her child, and how little attention in the biblical narrative is given to that. Um, there's more attention paid to David's grief, but Bathsheba had these double losses, and the and we all know, right, that that Advent, the holidays, can be an especially hard time for people who are 
grieving the death of loved ones who are feeling the inadequacy of their own lives in, in any number of ways when all the world is feels like is celebrating and happy and sparkly. If your life is not happy and sparkly, then you can feel like you're doing it wrong or it can just compound that grief. And Bathsheba called me to just make space for the grief if it's there. So, yeah, if if Bathsheba's story is one that you engage with with the congregation, I, I would certainly encourage um, a sensitivity to folks who have trauma and particularly sexual trauma in their history, um, not not to jump jump into that story lightly but this but the concept of having space for grief is something that applies in many ways on many levels um and for mary there's this interesting thing with all of these women in the first testament with tamar and rahab and ruth and bathsheba we know what they did we know some of their actions. We know some for some of them, some of their words, what they said. But it's not until we get to Mary that we have this glimpse into the interior life of, of a woman. She ponders twice, um, just in the beginning of Luke's gospel, uh, when the angel comes to her and she ponders what kind of message this might be, which seemed like a understatement, right? Of, oh, I wonder why there's an angel here, you know, uh, but she ponders. So we have this in the scene of the Annunciation, we see Mary, we see a little bit of what's going on inside of her as she's receiving this strange a uh, message from Gabriel. And then, of course, um, the one that I always knew, and I think that one isn't always trans, the Greek isn't always translated as pondered, but it is the same Greek word as the more famous phrase when after Jesus' birth, when Mary um, treasures all these things and ponders them in her heart, right? ponders them in her heart or in her gut, I guess. <laughs> um, and so I just, that treasuring and pondering is something that is really key for pastors in this time. It's like I was saying earlier, how we are trying to create these experiences and connections for so many other people. And when do we have the time to do our own pondering and treasuring and connecting? Um, and, and if you think about, I don't know, I love Mary a lot. I could talk about Mary forever and I promise I won't. But she, she's just, it's its like, then you think about what, what is she pondering, right? All, there's the message from the angel. There's the faithfulness of Joseph. Then there's these, these shepherds that just show up. I mean, we're so used to the, the Christmas pageants that we don't really blink about it. But like, what in the world, if you just gave birth to a child or your partner had just given birth to a child and these like smelly rowdy shepherds and their sheep just like showed up that is very odd and they're saying all of these things like what they're saying matches what the angel Gabriel said about who Jesus is and what will be happening but I don't know like right after I gave birth I was not really in a state to want to welcome <laughs> random strangers <laughs> or hear anything so it's just I don't know. She had a lot to ponder and treasure. <laughs> and we probably do too if we stop and think about it. So I hope that we find time in the season to stop and think and ponder. 
Um, yeah, so that's just my little tidbits from each of the women. Some things I carry with me as a pastor um, after spending time with their stories. And I would very much love to hear any from you all, if any of these women are some that you are particularly drawn to and why, or if you have any questions about them or about the book or any anything at all, a little lunch chat. <laughs> Tamana, could you talk a little bit about your process of writing this devotional? Yeah. Um, well, one thing was it was the manuscript was due right at the beginning of Lent. So partly it was just like a seasonal disconnect of like trying to get in an Advent mindset while I was also planning Ash Wednesday services. Um I mean, first, it was a matter of sort of defining the women's stories and discovering, you know, Tamar is a set story. Ruth is obviously, Rahab is a set story. Ruth is, well, Rahab is kind of two, a very long story or two stories. Ruth is the chapter. Bathsheba shows up three in three different books. So we have the, the Bathsheba whose husband is killed loses a baby, but then we have Queen Bathsheba later. And Rahab also shows up in the New Testament um, in two places besides the genealogy. So part, so the first piece was just pulling the scriptures in and then dividing the, the stories into shorter readings that I could reflect on. And in terms of then writing about it, um, this, this is not... Dr. May's not on here. <laughs> this is not a super scholarly researched footnoted. This is what the Greek word is kind of book. It was much more like, what does this story have to say? There's kind of this question at the center of that I carried of like, why did Matthew name these women? Why are there, why are they there? What do they have to teach us? And trying to read the story on the women's terms, not on the, not just what we are told on the surface by the narrator, but really thinking about what would the experience have been like for the woman um, in that place and in that time. And how does that speak to things that we're, that we experience today. Um, so it was kind of a devotional process of writing. Um, I mean, more polished than journal, than, than just kind of free writing or journaling, but that's where it started was just thinking about what, what, and there's a lot of questions in the book. You know, I wonder, like with Tamar, you know, I wonder who who went and grabbed this pregnant woman and was ready to light her on fire like what what who was that it wasn't judah because they had to send the cord and staff to him who are these people so devoted to this man that they would light a woman on fire and oh maybe we see some of these people in our society today who are so devoted to certain characters, certain people that they do damage without thinking about it. So those connections would pop up. Um, the blessings were written after the reflections. And um, I don't, I feel like I sound kind of woo woo when I talk about writing the blessings like I I know that like the spirit of Ruth was not like inhabiting my body or anything like that but I really felt like after walking in the stories and and walking through them with the women like I really did have a sense that these were blessings that were being offered from the women um and so that was a really powerful part of the writing process for me to do the to do the blessings 
And then I just switched into pastor mode when I did all the stuff at the end about how we use it for, for worship and small group and I, and just kind of, okay, what, what do pastors need? Let me let give them as much of that as I can to make their lives easier. I have, are you done, Joanna? Um, a few days ago, I just started rereading a book that I read 20 years ago or so called Women's Ways of Knowing. And um, the first way, which is what I'm in right now, um, is um, silence. And one thing that I, which uh, that's, that's a more negative way, but it's the way mo a lot of women tend to receive and um, interact with the world around them. And as I looked at these five women, one of my first thoughts was each of them spoke up for themselves in some way or other. They were not silent. And um, that is, just given what I'm reading now, it was just a neat juxtaposition. And, and and we can learn something from these five women in that area. I mean, some like Tamar was more action oriented, not necessarily words, though there were some, but each, but none of them were silent. None of them just stood by. So I don't have a question for you, <laughs> but I just made that connection. <laughs> so I want to share it. Yeah, no, that's a good one there. I was surprised at the connections. I mean, there's there's some strong narrative connections like Ruth and Tamar both seduce older male relatives of their deceased husbands in order to gain stability and a husband. I mean, we don't usually think of Ruth and Tamar as similar stories, but there are a lot of parallels in their stories. Shame is a factor, is a huge factor in all of these women's stories. I think that ties in with what you're talking about, mom, that these were women who, according to society, should have been ashamed of themselves and ashamed of what they did, but they didn't receive that shame because they were doing what they were doing out of their limited choices, out of necessity for survival, and they didn't they did what they needed to do. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, and they did it for, um, they were doing it because they were sure it was what God wanted. They had a reason to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and and as, as pastors, sometimes we come to those times when the only reason we keep going is because we know it's what we're called to do. And, and it's not what we are embracing at the time. And so that is a part of their stories too. But yeah, shame was a, a big thing in, in, in the uh, Women's Way to Know book. And that's what keeps a lot of women silent. They feel like everyone knows something that they should know. And if they speak up, then everyone will know they won't know it anyway. Sorry, I'm not gonna get into my reading, but thank you, I, I like that. Hi, Joanna. Nice to see you after all these years. Hi, Dr. Olson. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you for what you shared today. Uh, I have read that Matthew genealogy many, many times, and it strikes me today, a genealogy written by a male about males that just happened to include some women along the way. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I, as a male pastor, have preached about these within. Uh, but to read these with women's eyes from within women's experience and parallel experience uh, was such a gift to me today. And uh, though I don't get to preach anymore, I uh, just wonder uh, how I could ever 
bridge that gap to get within that experience as well as my own experience when I preach from on such texts, you know, uh, for a, a male reading this, uh, every time a woman is included, oh, sex. But uh, you have broken us open to, there is so much more there and so much going be beyond what, what the story is told. Do uh, you have uh, thoughts on how to get into stories like you did today? Mm. Now, I appreciate the question. One of the things I find myself saying when I talk about the book with people is that it's a book about women. It's not a woman's book. It's not only for women. And I realize how unnecessary that statement would be if it was a book about men. I wouldn't have to be saying it's not only a book for men. Um, so I think I think one piece of bridging the gap is to just be open to the full extent and expression of of scripture. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm just kind of weird or it's just how I read script. I just like to be to be in the story, you know. I I think asking questions is is most of what I do and and you have to be okay to not have comfortable not having answers because there's so much that we can never we we I mean maybe on the other side right when we're with God for eternity maybe we can but we but we won't we can't know who was going to light Tamar on fire we can't know all the thoughts in her head um and so it's it's a fine line with this type of with any biblical interpretation, right? We want to be faithful. And so what what is helpful questioning and, you know, the what ifs, I like to say, well, what if it was this way? And what if it was that way? And I think that can all be good and faithful. And we don't want to just make up random stuff that's not there, you know, so so the the exegesis and eisegesis and all all that um so i'm not sure where that line is but i think if our heart is in wanting to to be faithful to god to use the scriptures to understand ourselves better to connect more deeply with god i i think the holy spirit honors that desire that we bring uh to our to our reading and i would be more worried about having too narrow of a reading than I would be about having too broad of a reading. I think it, God probably enjoys some of the crazy ideas that we have. And as, <laughs> I don't know. In thinking about the, the genealogy itself, another piece that's really interesting to me, uh, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth are named. Interestingly, both of Tamar's twin boys are named, even though Perez was the only one who was biologically part of the genealogy. But that, so by naming her twin sons, that is honoring Tamar, right? That is an extra honor that she had not one, but two boys. And then when it gets to Bathsheba, her name is not included. She is referred to as the wife of Uriah. So that is that is a slam on King David, right? Like, oh, here's this child, this child of King, da that is King David by the wife of another man. How did that make it through centuries of councils and textual editing, right? That's crazy to me that she is the wife of Uriah, which on one hand you could say, oh, well, she's not named, but I, I, that is just a statement of 
the complexity of her story and the and I think calls into question King David right there in the very genealogy that is to a certain extent entire purpose is to show that Jesus is related to King David because that is how that is is part of the showing that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's, so Matthew's kind of like, sure, Jesus is related to David by the wife of another man he had no business being, right? It, it's, it's really fascinating to me that that line is in the genealogy. Well, as a lay person participating, and uh, you you interest me in in trying to listen and in and uh, take these women into your interior process, and uh, I don't know why, but I realized when you were naming these women that Rahab, as I slowly emerged from the fundamentalism of my youth where everything had to be either this or that in a very binary way, the very audacity of paradox enlivened me and gave me permission. And for some reason, Rahab particularly struck me as uh, not only unusual, but audacious that, uh, that this could be in Jesus lineage and be a, uh, a prostitute, and it just strangely gave me permission to open my own mind and be willing to understand paradox. Yeah, Rahab is, it's almost like her name is Rahab the prostitute. She's mentioned, um, I think, seven times, and Four of them are, you know, right at the prostitute. That's just kind of how she's known. But then she also is, and I'm looking up to see the exact wording here, but she's also mentioned twice, like I said, in the New Testament, beyond the genealogy, in these lists of people of faith in the epistles. Um, and in one of them in James, let's see here, James 2.23. Um, so you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them to another road? Um, they've been talking about Abraham and then Rahab. So there's this list of faithful people. And um, in Hebrews, there's there's a longer list. In James, there's only two faithful people. One of them is Abraham, duh. And the other one is Rahab the prostitute. Like she's still being referred to as Rahab the prostitute, even in this list with Abraham as one of the faithful. I'm fascinated by this. I don't quite understand it. And I'm really interested in what, how Rahab and her story developed within the Jewish community to elevate her to this status. And, and Rahab is also the only one of the, the women in the genealogy who, if you only read the, the First Testament story of her, you would not know she was a mother. For Tamar and Ruth and Bathsheba and Mary, the fact of their motherhood is kind of the point of their stories as we read them in scripture. Rahab, you wouldn't even know had any children except that she's mentioned in the genealogy. It is not, her motherhood is not her identity at all. And she stands out from, um, in, I mean, that that paradox that, that Dave was talking about. And, and also she stands out from the other women in that way as being just a, a character, uh, an important in and of herself, not because she had a child. And the, having a child wasn't her reward. Like for Tamar, you know, the reward for her faithfulness was that she had twins. 
the reward for Rahab's faithfulness is that she doesn't die, right? She saves herself and her family. So yeah, Rahab is a very interesting in and of herself. And then what, how she was regarded within the community and how that was held together, her heroism, while also always keeping this, the prostitute attached to her name, um, it fascinates me. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> we went to school together. Um, I don't really know exactly what it is I'm trying to say. I, I know when we were in school, we were still thinking kind of like mothers of small children. And when we're talking to children, we teach them not to lie, never <laughs> lie. Lying is bad. But as you talk about Rahab, who is one of my all-time favorites, I a couple of my other all-time favorites are Pua and Shipra in the Exodus story. And they were just big old liars. They just, <laughs> you know, got before Pharaoh and lied through their teeth, but they saved their people. Mm -hmm. And Rahab really helped save the Hebrew people. So that may have something to do with the question you were asking of how is it that these guys were so central? Um, mm -hmm. I think part of it is because they shrewdly lied and saved the people. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really play well on a, on a, uh, easy level teaching children. Right. It's but not your children's sermon. <laughs> it's not your children's sermon that right. That's right. Go lie for Jesus. But uh, <laughs> but it is it's interesting. It's very interesting. I remember I was preaching on Jacob and Esau once and looking up things online. Like every little children's sermon suggestion was like and you can explain to the kids how they shouldn't lie to their mom and dad. And I was like, that uh -huh. is not what this story is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like That's lying, exactly lying right. worked out really well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jacob here. So yeah, I think a lot of that, I mean, it, yeah. And that's why actually um, in the worship suggestions here for the children's time, I basically say like, these are not kids <laughs> like the, the children's time suggestion is to spend a Sunday talking about our family trees and like different you know like I have adopted kids like there are different ways yeah. to understand that and then to yeah. invite people from the congregation to share story with the kids about one of their female their grandma or great grandma or some you know That's because great. these are really hard stories and part of it I think goes back to the issue of power I was talking with one of the central students who was at the book signing whose name I don't remember um he's Episcopalian but we were talking about that like when you have a lot of power you can be honest um yeah CJ thank you yeah you can you know you can afford to be honest it's not dangerous to be truthful and honest. Um, when you don't have power, you have different options. So, um, yeah, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about. And, and you certainly don't want to be preaching sermons. Like you said, lying for, let's all go lie for Jesus. Lie for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. um, and also, that's what I love about these dealing with these women in Advent too. Like the bottom line is like, it's complicated, right? Like life is just messy and complicated. And from the outside, you're not in a position to pass judgments because you don't, you don't know what options people had. So how can you judge what options that they took? I mean, yes, yeah, should should you dress up as a prostitute to sleep with your father-in-law? As a general rule, no, bad idea. But for Tamar, what were her other choices? Mm -hmm. You know, and 
And like, and then, so you think about how messy it all is. And then you think, why in the world did God, like, what is up with the incarnation? What, like, how much love is that for God to become human for us? Knowing full well, what a hot mess we all are. I think I just heard the title to your next book. <laughs> what a hot mess we all are. <laughs> <laughs> and what is up with the incarnation? <laughs> with the incarnation. <laughs> Thank you. Joanna, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the um, the worship, digital worship resources that are available also. Yeah. And I can put the link in the chat. Link the link. Yeah. So the the images that Michelle did and the um and the blessings are available for digital download and they're just the images or or different combinations so you can use them as bulletin covers or whatever and they did also add the worship uh liturgies that are in the book to that digital download file as a word document so you could change pieces if you need to for your context and then the but purchasing the digital download which i think is ten dollars um then gives you permission to use the images the blessings the worship stuff with your congregation in newsletters during worship what however it might be it might be helpful there's a, a columbus mennonite church i just got a picture from their pastor they've they've taken these these beautiful images that that michelle did let me show you the if i were like really on the ball i would be able to, i would have these ready to share on the screen but i don't but here's the uh one for mary with the stars um but the columbus mennonite has taken these images and blown them up like poster size and they're mounting them on a uh, glass blocks with lights in them so there's light shining through it's so and they're having a whole display because they're using the book then for their um worship series so different uh congregations are doing some different things with with those images as well that's fantastic any other questions or comments for Joanna before we wrap up today? Well, Joanna, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks so much. Oh, go ahead, Angie. I saw you unmute. I just wanted to tell Joanna, thank you. And um, I'm looking so forward to a week from Sunday. <laughs> um, to be, I've been holding off beginning the reading um to read it you know at the appropriate time and I really look forward to it um actually I'm moving right now and it's the only book that I haven't packed I left it out <laughs> so that we would have access to it during the season and so um this was just really really a nice time today so thank you for being willing to do that um and sharing your thought process with us thanks Angie Yes, thank you so much for helping prepare each of us um, as we as we get prepared for this season. Um, thanks for sharing with us today, but thank you for sharing your gift with the world and, and writing this book and in many of the ways that you um, both pastor your congregation, but also offer um, worship resources for for the world. So we're so grateful. Um, and it, it dawned on me as you were talking that, you know, Jesus, the, the genealogy of Jesus, um, and, and the stories of these women, um, but then also these amazing women, um, at the tomb. And so, so maybe that's the next devotional you could write for us. Too. <laughs> would, would you like me to send you with one of the blessings from the book? I would, yes, we would absolutely, let me make a couple announcements first, and sure. then that would be a perfect ending for us. Um, so just thank you to everyone for, for joining with us today. Great to see you all here. This recording will be available um, either later today or tomorrow on Central's YouTube page. Um, so if you want to watch it again or send it to someone who couldn't be here today, um, please, you can find it there. We don't have a lunch and learn scheduled in December. 
Um, so this is our last one for 2022, but we um, look forward to 2023 and ask that you would stay tuned for more information. Um, and in the meantime, wish you a um, wonderful Thanksgiving and a blessed Advent and Christmas season. And Joanna, please send us out with a blessing. This is Sophia's blessing uh, from John's prologue and Proverbs 8. My love, you are a delight, like watching springs bubble up and hills emerge, like feeling the first fertile soil and seeing tiny green sprouts, like gasping in wonder as stars fill the sky and ocean waves lap against immeasurable sand. You are a delight and a joy, my love. So the blessing I offer is a simple one. Be who you are. Be what you have been intended to be since the beginning of all things. Be what I have created you to be. Delightful, delighted, light, life, love. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. you all. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks so much, Joanna. This was amazing. <laughs>